Hey everybody. This video is going to go over the PowerPoint in the week 5 module on analyzing arguments. Um, this is really an overview of what we call rhetorical analysis. So let's look at the word analysis first. Um, analysis is the act of investigating how something works. How something works. It involves looking at the individual parts of something, um, understanding those parts, and then understanding how all the parts work together to form the whole. So for instance, if we were going to analyze the car engine, we would and, and figure out how it, the car engine works, we would want to look at all the individual components that make up the engine. So we would look at like the pistons, the battery, the air filter, all the other things that are part of a car engine. And we would, you know, do our best to understand how each of those individual components work and then how they all work together to form the engine and make the car run. So when we analyze an argument, the individual parts and components that we're looking at are what we call rhetorical moves, or sometimes you'll hear them called rhetorical strategies. So that means we're looking at how the line of reasoning proceeds, how examples are used to support the claim, how the opposition is treated, um, how underlying values give way to appeals, uh, or how the audience or how the audience is engaged, how the author engages the audience. So basically, what that means is when we analyze an argument, we are looking at all the things we have learned about so far, how all of those things work together to form the argument. Um, and you have to have what we call an analytical posture when doing analysis. And all that means is making sure you remember that analysis has a very specific goal to understand how the argument works. So you need to have a particular mindset when you're analyzing an argument. And the truth is, is that that mindset you need to have is really different from our most basic reflexes when we read an argument. So most of the time when we encounter any kind of argument, our first reflex is to respond to seek out where we agree or disagree with the argument. Um, maybe even to judge the argument. Is it strong or is it weak? Is it effective or does it fail? But in analysis, you really have to put those reflexes on hold. You have to just put them to the side. Don't even think about it because the purpose of analysis is not to respond to the argument. It is not to agree or disagree and it's not to make a judgment on the argument. Analysis is a claim of fact. When you provide an analysis of an argument, you are providing a factual claim about that argument in terms of how the parts all work together to form the whole. Um, so again, it's very important to remember we're not talking about our reaction to the argument. We're literally looking at how it works. So you could read an argument. You could be asked to analyze an argument that you completely disagree with. And maybe your, your, your true personal opinion is that it's garbage. That it's just, you know, that it may, that it just is so off the mark. However, if you're being asked to analyze that argument, you have to put all that aside and you still have to look at what the author incorporates in the argument to try to make their point. You could be reading an argument that is really weak. You know, um, whether you agree or disagree is beside the point. The argument itself falls short. They don't do enough. They don't use enough examples or they're not using the right examples or whatever the case may be. It's just weak for one reason or another. And your first reaction might be to discuss why it's weak, how it fails, 
but that's not what your goal is with analysis. You still have to analyze that argument and talk about all the things the author does to try to persuade the reader. Thinking about the, you know, it, their intention was to persuade. Their intention was to get us to see their point of view and accept their claim. So how did they go about doing that? Whether or not they succeeded is a totally different discussion and, you know, something to save for a later time. But with analysis, it's literally just what did they do to try to succeed with their argument? And that's it. Um, so I have an example in the PowerPoint of a, a passage, um, an argumentative passage on Facebook, uh, about Facebook. <laughs> um, and I'm sure many of us have a, a pretty clear response to the argument made in the, the paragraph. So Facebook is fun. It connects people to old friends and many would say it even generates new friendships. But here's a question that's not often asked. So what? Even if we accept the idea that friends confirmed on Facebook are anything close to real friendship and only the most giddy among us would, we might ask ourselves if another corporate controlled friend making device should be so celebrated. While America is well known as a civilization absolutely turned in on itself, unaware of its own history, ignorant of the grisly business just outside its borders, millions of otherwise savvy thinkers are spending countless hours learning what their e-friends are drinking or feeling after drinking whatever they drink. Certainly, Facebook fans would say that many users trade important views about war, poverty, history, religion, and so on. But there's nothing about Facebook itself that urges hard reflection on such matters. In fact, the medium works primarily to thrust quick blurby opinions back and forth. From what I've seen in my admittedly limited experience, Facebook is yet another bourgeois tool for celebrating me, my personal thoughts, and my closed bubble of acquaintances. Like an electronic junior high click, it reinforces a pre-adolescent take on the world. Like Fox News, like most morning news programs, like most talk radio, like mainstream sports, Facebook bolsters the everything I like about my life mentality that civilizations at some point must evolve beyond. Clearly an argument being made in the paragraph. <laughs> and we probably all have our own reaction to the argument presented. Um, we might totally agree, or we might think that he is just ranting and talking nonsense and not supporting his claim well enough. But those reactions veer towards claims of value, whether or not the argument is good, whether or not it's successful. And remember, analysis is all about a claim of fact. You're claiming, when you do an analysis, you are claiming this is how the argument works. So our urge to agree or disagree pulls us into the argument. Do you see that? If we start responding to the claim, then we have entered into the argument. But an analytical posture demands that we remain outside of the argument. We have to stay on analytical ground. So. To be an analytical reader, you have to keep asking yourself, how does the argument work? Not, do I agree or disagree? Not, is it a strong or weak argument? Just, how does it work? That's it. Um, it's often called rhetorical analysis um, when we analyze an argument because if you think if you think about you know well how does an argument work well it works based on those rhetorical moves that are used the claim that's presented the type of support that's being used the counter arguments that are being presented the concessions the warrants the qualifiers the values and assumptions everything we've learned about so far those are the components that make an argument work so if you're trying to analyze how an argument works you're going to be looking for all of those things. How, what is included out of all of those elements? 
how does the author use all of those elements and how do they all work together to form the argument as a whole? So that's why it's called rhetorical analysis because um, we're analyzing the rhetoric of the argument. Remember, the rhetoric is the art of persuasion and all the things we use to persuade. So we're analyzing the rhetoric. What is being used for persuasion? Um, and the thing is, is you know, they aren't going to be announced in the argument. It's not like, you know, the author is going to say, and here's a good counter argument <laughs> or, you know, um, let me explain the values and assumptions that are involved. No, we have to look for them. That's why it's so important to understand all of those elements that we have looked at so far this quarter, because we have to find them in the arguments we're reading and, in, and engaging with. Okay. Um, going back to that passage on Facebook, you can start to take an analytical posture with it. Forget about how you feel. Forget about your response, your opinion of the argument. And think about simply, how does he try to convince us? What does he use? What rhetorical devices does he use to try to convince us? Um, we see that there are some allusions used in the paragraph. Remember, allusions are when we make references to things in history or pop culture that the audience would already be familiar with. Um, so he refers to Fox News, talk radio, and mainstream sports, and morning talk shows or morning news programs, right? So he is comparing, he's making an allusion there to those things so that it deepens our understanding of what he's trying to say about Facebook. Whether we agree or disagree is beside the point. That's what he's trying to do. Um, his appeals to value. He makes mention of the fact that America is well known for being um, a country totally turned in on itself. Basically, we're oblivious to our own history. We really don't pay attention to the world at large. Um, even our closest neighbors to the north and south, you know. We probably don't have a clue what's going on in Canada or Mexico or any other part of South America, right? Maybe some of us do, but <clears throat> America as a whole seems to be very much obsessed with itself. <laughs> um, and he claim, you know, he of course presents that as a bad thing. He's not celebrating that. So if those are bad things, then he wants us to feel that it's a bad thing as well. And how does he do that? He he words it in a way so that we understand that we need to value knowledge and history and maturity. The junior high click reference that he made. So he's appealing to our values for those things to make us see how Facebook does not go with those values. Um, he appeals to logic. Uh, you know, even if we accept the idea that friends confirmed on Facebook are anything close to real friendship, you know, so if we accept, even if we accept this premise here, um, we might ask ourselves if another corporate mediated friend making device should be so celebrated. So you need some logic there. And then he makes a concession, right, where he points out where the opposing point of view uh, makes a valid point. Um, that Facebook is fun, right? Uh, he gives a counter argument because he says in the paragraph that some people out there are going to disagree with me and they're going to say that Facebook is not just all about the self-obsessed people, you know, presenting everything about their perfect lives, that there really is a place where it really is a place where people can share opinions and ideas and have debates and have discussions. And so he provides a counter argument to that opposing view and says, but there's nothing about Facebook itself that actually urges hard reflection, right? Um, it's actually, it works by thrusting, you know, in order to thrust blurby opinions back and forth. So he argues against what he imagines the opposition is going to say. He provides a counter argument. He even provides a qualifier in there. 
he admits that he has very limited experience with Facebook. So, you know, that might make us feel like, well, if you have limited experience, what do you, you know, you don't know what you're talking about then. On the other hand, it could also be seen as, okay, he's not claiming to be an expert, but, you know, he is still entitled to <clears throat> share how he perceives Facebook based on that limited experience. Because it's not really his experience that matters. <clears throat> it's everything else around it. Um, so we have pointed out quite a few rhetorical moves that he uses just in that one single paragraph, right? Um, so we are on an analytical path at this point. We have started looking at the individual parts. We have found them, we've identified them, right? But analysis goes beyond just labeling, right? So just pointing out this is where he where he uses an appeal to value, or this is where he includes a counter argument. That's not enough. That's just the first step. <clears throat> so the, the next part is then explaining how each part functions. You have to, um, you can't just say something is an appeal to value and then move on. You have to explain why that matters, how that appeal to value works in the argument. <clears throat> so we have an example here of an analysis of the Facebook passage. Um, and it, it identifies an appeal, a rhetorical move, but it also explains how the appeal works in the passage. So the example here says, Johnson's argument against Facebook relies on several appeals to value, especially to the concept of world knowledge. Johnson calls on readers to condemn Facebook primarily because it fixes users' concentration on personal, even petty, rather than global issues. The worst parts of American culture, he argues, are those that turn people's attention inward away from a world of difference. The passage suggests that global consciousness is inherently good while self-involvement is a form of arrested development, a reflex that keeps people and entire civilizations from maturing. The appeal is most apparent in the description of Facebook users as junior high children who disregard the bigger world beyond their own small social network. So it does more than just point out that he uses an appeal to value. It explains how he uses that appeal in his argument. Right, that's what we're searching for. We're looking um, <clears throat> to see how all of those rhetorical elements function. How does the author use them? Um, and hopefully, by looking at those and figuring out how the author uses the rhetorical elements, it's going to lead us down a path of new insights. Good analysis discovers something about a text or an ad or a speech, whatever, um, whatever the argument is contained in, it discovers something new about it, some complexity or some underlying connection, some underlying principle, something that goes beyond just what's right in front of us, right? Um, it should lead us to a better, richer understanding of the thing itself. Um, so we have some examples here. Uh, of some analysis. One is with, um, um, on slide 11, we have uh, an example of some analysis based on an ad. Um, in her analysis of a Benetton clothing ad, Megan Ward discovers something about the interplay between the ad and its broader context. The ad itself says very little. But through careful analysis, Ward is able to show that its complexity is bound to the cultural argument it quietly engages. So it doesn't say much, but because of the specific choices made in the image, it hits upon um, other arguments within our culture, within society. So without directly talking about those cultural arguments, it subtly reaches out and touches on them. 
And we have to follow that. We have to figure out what else the ad is referring to. And then we get a better understanding of the argument. So here's an excerpt from Ward's overall analysis of the Benetton ad. She says, Benetton engages its audience on an immediate emotional level with the bare images of meat so starkly presented. And this is in the textbook if you want to look at the ad. Um, but when we acknowledge that ad's context, all the cultural debates about race, difference, and equality, we can see how it argues on a much broader stage. So she looks at the image, she looks at the ad, and she goes beyond just a simple, you know, explanation of what the ad is, uh, what it contains and what it's trying to accomplish. She realizes that there were specific, deliberate choices made in what image they were going to use for this ad, and that it that's worth looking at further. Why, then? did they deliberately choose this specific image? What else should we be thinking about when we look at that image? What other topics or issues or arguments within our society, within our culture, might be referenced because they used this specific image? So she's looking beyond just what's right in front of her and she is providing a new understanding of the ad. That's our goal with analysis. Um, in the passage from the analysis on the film Avatar, I'm not going to read the whole thing <clears throat> on this one, but basically what this author, Benjamin Weatherby, what he discovers when he's analyzing the, the film and he's not analyzing it as a film, he's analyzing it as an argument. What argument is being made in the film? And one thing he notices is that, you know, uh, the, 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 the people of, in the Avatar movie, their culture, um, you know, they, they don't, promote unnecessarily, unnecessary violence. Um, basically, he's saying that in the end, though, there is this act of violence, and it is celebrated, and the audience cheers for it. And it's almost like the filmmakers, the writers, the producers, the directors, they all knew that American audiences would expect a um, a violent showdown in the end um, and that it would be celebrated. However, that goes against everything that um, that these people in the movie stand for. <laughs> um, so he points out this tension, something that a lot of people probably wouldn't think about. When he looks at the, how the movie tries to present its argument, he finds a contradiction within it. And that's pretty cool. You can read that whole analysis in the textbook as well if you'd like. <laughs> um, so we now know what the goal of analysis is, right? we got to identify those rhetorical moves and then explain how they're used by the author in the argument. But how do we get to that point? What should we do first? The first thing that you have to do before you try to explain how an argument works is you have to be sure that you understand what it is arguing. You have to, you have to know what the argument is all about. Um, you have to understand that in order to accurately discuss the claims and everything that goes into the argument. And one way you can make sure you do that is through summary. So typically in a rhetorical analysis, there will be an, a brief summary in towards the, the beginning of the essay. Brief summary. <laughs> 
just enough um, to, so that the reader understands the context of the argument. However, before you get to that, before you even start drafting, it's a good idea to give a bigger summary, a, a, a lengthier summary, just on a scratch piece of paper, just to ensure that you yourself fully understand the argument before you start trying to analyze it. So you can do that, that longer summary before you really even jump into the analysis. But then even once you jump into the analysis, you will still have to provide some summary here and there along the way. Um, you'll have kind of that brief background information in the beginning where you give the context and explain a little bit about the argument. And then even throughout the essay, there might be times where you summarize sections of the argument in order to get to the rhetorical move that you want to look at. Um, so on slide 14, we have side-by-side uh, -side, a summary by itself, and then a summary with analysis incorporated into it. So the summary literally just gives a brief overview of the essay. In her argument, Holly Wren Spalding celebrates the power of darkness, genuine darkness that is not injured by artificial light. She explains how nighttime gives birth to vital dimensions of light, connectivity to others, an ability to wonder, the reflex to extend outward and feel something other than fear. Part of this celebration involves condemning the increasing drive to illuminate the world. She denounces the uncritical and deeply ingrained habit of keeping on the lights. There's nothing expressed about how the argument is being presented, how she's doing it, anything like that. Um, it's just a summary, just an overview of what she discusses in the essay. Now, we have an example here of summary and analysis. Spalding begins her fifth paragraph with a general point about modern industrial society. She says that we, in this current age, favor electrical light, that it defines our lives. This character, and that's the summary, right? This characterization puts her arguments and her readers in time, in the long epic narrative of human species. She describes herself and her readers as we modern industrial technological homo sapiens, which puts us in proportion with the bigger human story. And this desire for proportion, for understanding ourselves in proper relation with the rest of the world, is a major component of Spalding's argument. All right, so at this point in the analysis, the author of the analysis is looking at that fifth paragraph and what Spalding Young does, or Spalding does in that fifth paragraph. So they give a little bit of summary as to what is going on in the fifth paragraph, but just a sentence or two, and then they move right into the rhetorical moves that she uses in the fifth paragraph. So looking at those two examples, if we were to think of an essay, a rhetorical analysis essay, the summary on the left-hand side is what would come towards the beginning of the essay. After your formal introduction, um, but before you get into the actual analysis of the argument. And then the example on the right, the summary and analysis, that is what you would find in the body of your essay. So somewhere along the way, as you are analyzing the argument, you are going to have to provide brief summaries here and there as you move into that particular analysis, All right? Um, you want to make sure that, <laughs> you know, summary is important to analysis, but it can also become a problem. Notice that that brief summary that I said would probably go towards the beginning of the essay, it's still only a very brief paragraph. It is not going into a lot of specific details about um, Spalding's essay. Just a very brief overview of it. And she doesn't, you know, the author of the analysis doesn't give us sentence upon sentence upon sentence of summary in the version on the right either. There is a balance because if you aren't careful, summary 
can start to overshadow the analysis. Um, you want to make sure that summary does not start to take over your essay. To accomplish genuine analysis, you have to identify um, the, the argumentative move, the rhetorical move, and then explain how it works. You will need bits and pieces of summary along the way, but very minimal, right? Remember what the overall purpose of the essay is. It is to analyze the argument, to identify the parts of the argument and how they all work together to form the whole. In order for your reader to have a better understanding, you will have to provide some summary here and there along the way, right? Okay, um, we have some examples here where we go from summary to almost analysis to true analysis, okay? So um, on slide 16, we have summary. In his third paragraph, Brown says that we have lost the intimate dialogue that comes from walking in our everyday lives. He goes on to blame cars for pulling us away from downtown communities and two suburban shopping centers. All summary. Nothing was pointed out there about any kind of rhetorical move that was used or how the argument is working. It is literally just a summary, an overview of the third paragraph of Brown's essay. So now we're going to tack on some, we're going to start to try to get into some analysis of, you know, Brown's essay. In Brown's sixth paragraph, he appeals to value. Right, we've identified a rhetorical move, so we are moving into analysis land. He argues that our communities are homes, but he says we don't treat them as such. Instead, we drive quickly through them for the sake of convenience. Mm. Well, we pointed out the rhetorical move, the appeal to value, but we didn't actually explain what the appeal to value was or how it worked. We moved into summary. We summarized the sixth paragraph. So this is just almost like a, a mishmash here. Like we're just throwing things together. Here's the analytical move that's used. Here's some summary. And we didn't join them. We didn't incorporate them and we didn't explain the rhetorical move. So for true analysis, this is what we would get. In Brown's sixth paragraph, he appeals to value by connecting the over-reliance on cars and the breakdown of community. Brown draws our attention to the inherent good in familiarity, location, and social connectedness. He then shows how car culture undermines those principles, those ideals that people seem to cherish but also ignore on their way to the shopping plaza on the other side of town. So now we got a little bit of that summary because, you know, they refer to his words about, um, you know, familiarity and convenience, you know, and moving, going right past those downtown areas to get to the suburban shopping centers, right? So they have included a little bit of context, but that passage right there is true analysis. They have not only pointed out a rhetorical move that was used, but they go on to explain what it means, how it was used, right? That's our goal. Um, you'll see, oh, there's another example there for um, Spalding's essay if you wanna look at that. Uh, but I wanna move to slide 18 um, because talking about all of this, the analytical posture and how analysis works, um, you want to make sure that you don't fall victim to the four common pitfalls of analysis. These are errors that people make pretty regularly when they are attempting to do analysis. First, don't make a case. Making a case is bad. Do not be tempted to agree with or further support the author's argument. If you are totally on board with everything the author presents in the argument, we can't know it. <laughs> you, you have to keep that to yourself. You cannot make a case. You cannot further support the claim that's being made. You also do not want to describe the effect. Don't be tempted to go overboard 
and imagine how the argument might affect an audience. That's not our goal either. We're not trying to figure out how good or bad or how weak or strong or effective or ineffective the argument is. We're simply trying to figure out how it works. So don't go into that area where you're going to start imagining how well or not well the, argue, the, the audience responded to the, the essay. You know, for instance, you might be doing a rhetorical analysis on something that was written 50, 60, 75 years ago. You cannot start talking about how effective the argument was on its audience. You probably were not there. <laughs> and again, that's not the purpose of an analysis anyway. Talking about how effective the argument is, is a different type of essay. We're doing rhetorical analysis right now. So stick with how the argument works. Do not try to describe the author's intent. Um, we don't know. We can't tell that. Again, it also has no place in true analysis, how the argument works. But more importantly, it would be false anyway, because there's no way for us to know what the arguer intended or thought or felt. The last thing is, and I've kind of said this too, don't go into evaluation mode. We are in analysis mode, how it works. We are not in evaluation mode, how good, how well did it work, <laughs> right? Do you see the difference? So analysis is simply very cut and dry, very clinical, if you will. How does it work? Evaluation starts to ponder then, how well did it work? We don't want that yet. We just want analysis. How does it work? Right? So in review, um, analysis involves seeing how all the individual parts work together and add up to form the whole. When we analyze argument, we're, the, the parts that we're looking at are the rhetorical moves that we've learned about so far. Claims, support, proofs, appeals, um, counter-argument, opposition, concession, qualifiers, all of those things. Values and assumptions. Do Which of those show up in the argument? Can we find them and identify them? And then how do they actually work within the argument? What does the arguer try to do with them to make his point? Um, don't forget that we need that analytical posture, right? We're not here to, to do anything else except discover the parts and how they work together. Um, and in that process, we're hoping to discover something new about the argument, some complexity, some underlying connection, or some underlying principle. Um, be sure that before you start trying to analyze an argument that you understand what it is being uh, what it is arguing first so use summary to your advantage beforehand just your own little scratch summary you don't even have to write it down necessarily you could just verbally try to summarize the argument make sure you understand it fully first then you can start getting into the analysis and showing us how it works you might need to provide a brief summary in the beginning of your analysis probably some like right after your formal introductory paragraph. Um, but again, that's probably only going to be a, a short paragraph worth of information. And then you might also need to provide brief summary along the way as you are moving into each section of the argument. Um, don't let summary overshadow your analysis, though. It really is just a small portion of what you need in a rhetorical analysis. The focus is on the rhetorical move that the arguer uses. Don't fall for those four common pitfalls. Make sure you're not making a case, that you're not describing the effect, that you're not describing the author's intent, and that you are not trying to evaluate the argument, right? Um, you're gonna be looking at uh, some sample rhetorical analysis for homework this week. So hopefully through this, the PowerPoint and the video and the homework assignment, you will get an even better understanding of what rhetorical analysis is all about. This is the type of essay that you will be writing for the final exam essay. You will be doing a rhetorical analysis 
of one of the images that we look that we'll be looking at in the weekly discussions throughout the quarter. So it is super important that you understand exactly what rhetorical analysis is all about. There is another PowerPoint after this one and video lesson. It's really it's geared towards rhetorical analysis of visual argument. So that PowerPoint and video will be even more helpful when it comes time to do the final exam essay because that's what you'll be doing, a rhetorical analysis of visual argument. So go ahead and move on and look through that PowerPoint and watch that video lesson. And if you have any questions about this one, please let me know.